Welcome. I'm honored and privileged to be able to give you my understanding of the underlying inflammatory mechanisms of nasal polyposis and airway comorbidities. My name is Reynold A. Panettieri, Jr. I'm Vice Chancellor for Translational Medicine and Science and Director of the Rutgers Institute for Translational Medicine and Science, Professor of Medicine at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. I do have some disclosures. This is a medical affairs program sponsored by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation, and I'm being compensated for time. This presentation is a non-CME event and does not qualify for CME, CE, or MOC credit. The content and views expressed herein do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or position of the American Thoracic Society. Now, the clinical presentation of nasal polyps is important, and nasal polyposis is the chronic inflammation of nasal mucosa characterized by multiple and bilateral nasal polyps. That's demonstrated in the cartoon on the right. Now, the nasal polyps are non-cancerous lesions arising from the lining of the nasal sinuses or nasal cavity. We're going to cover that in a bit, but the cartoon clearly shows the symptoms that are associated with the clinical presentation of nasal polyps. That is headache and facial pain. There's nasal obstruction, congestion, reduction of loss of smell uh, with typically watery rhinorrhea and postnasal drip. In the call out, you can see the polypoid tissue that is bracketed by the septum and the turbinate. In the next slide, the local presentation really impacts on overall disease burden, and it is substantial. That is the disease burden associated with nasal polyposis. Not only do we have the symptoms, but this can often lead to difficulties in sleep and sleep disruption, fatigue, and sadness, embarrassment, reduced concentration, and overall a reduction in productivity. So nasal polyps has a significant burden of disease. Now, the frequently associated comorbidities with nasal polyps are myriad. In, in this cartoon, you can see nasal polyps is in the center of the universe, but it's surrounded by multiple other diseases, cystic fibrosis, allergic rhinitis, chronic rhinitis, asthma, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, and infection. All of these comorbidities impact on the burden of disease. So again, when one sees nasal polyps, it's usually within the context of other diseases, making the management of those other diseases quite difficult. Now, the combined impact on clinical presentation is demonstrated here. Uh, with patients with asthma, about 7% also have chronic rhinitis with nasal polyps about 20 to 60% with chronic rhinocytositis with nasal polyps also have asthma. So you can see how these walk hand in hand. Now, with that conceptual model, when nasal polyps is associated with asthma, there's typically poor asthma control, greater airway obstruction and airway inflammation. Shared inflammatory processes and comorbidities. If we think about the unified airway disease theory, that starts from the tip of the nose and it goes into the lower airways associated with comorbidities. Upper and lower airways are the result of shared inflammatory processes within the respiratory tract. Understanding the inflammatory mechanisms are important to guide therapy and improve outcomes. In this slide, you can see chronic rhinocytositis with and without nasal polyps is the phenotype, and it can be manifested by at least three types of inflammation, type one, type two, and type three. Now in type one, we think of interferon gamma as playing a critical role and neutrophilia. Type two is the classic 
inflammatory signal manifested by IL-4, 5, and 13 with the acidophils and cystineal leukotrienes occurring. Type 3 is the TH17 mediated IL-17, IL-22 neutrophilic inflammatory. Now about 85% of patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps fits into the type two inflammatory response. There is recurrence of the nasal polyp, enhanced asthma risk, as well as increased disease severity. Now type two inflammation in airways disease runs hand in hand. In addition to nasal polyps associated with chronic rhinosinusitis, CRS, allergic rhinitis is predominantly defined by type two endotype, Greater than 50% of patients with mild to moderate asthma present with a type 2 high endotype. And type 2 inflammatory response is a key component of aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, AERD, particularly in association with asthma and nasal polyps. Now, what we do recognize is that T2 inflammation can be driven by bacteria, viruses, proteases, fungi and allergens, and it can occur in a atopic and non-atopic manner. In the next series of slides, we're really going to do a deep dive into the molecular pathways by which type 2 inflammation occurs in the airways. Here, we're looking at the type 2 inflammatory cascade in nasal polyposis to highlight again its bacteria, allergens, viruses, proteases and fungi that can mediate the type 2 inflammation. In some instances, this is driven by alarmants secreted by the epithelium. And the alarmants we're talking about are TSLP, IL-33, and IL-25. These can trigger an inflammatory response marked by type 2 inflammation. We can see how the alarmants can actually activate the adaptive response inducing dendritic cell secretion and activation mediating a cd4 th2 cell proliferation cross talking to b cells and the cd4 th2 lymphocyte subset can secrete 4 5 and 13. in some instances alarmants activate the ilc2 subset of T cells. This is the innate response, again, secreting 4, 5, and 13. Again, 4 can cause B cell switching to secrete IgE, and you notice the IgE is playing a central role in the activation of mast cells, and will cover momentarily activation of basophils. Now, the mast cell can secrete leukotrienes and prostaglandins that can crosstalk to the ILC2 pathway. You can see how these pathways are interrelated and can actually have a feed forward or feed backward response. Now, in some instances, the IL-5 will induce eosinophil trafficking, and it is a survival factor for eosinophils. In the context of remodeling and polyposis formation, IL-13 does play an important role. The IL-13 can induce matrix deposition. It could also stimulate mucus secretion and goblet cell hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Now, some of those pathways are mediated again by antigen-specific Ig binding of immunocytes, which perpetrates and orchestrates this inflammatory diathesis. You can start to understand how this remodeling can play with the ongoing inflammation that is occurring. So that pathway can occur in the upper airway as well as in the lower airway. But what happens when the polyp is developing? In this slide, you can see a pristine respiratory epithelium with submucosal glands and the other resident inflammatory cells, such as dendritic cells, Th2 cells, B cells, mast cells, and also some resident eosinophils. 
So how does the polyp actually develop? Well, with enhanced mucus secretion, in part being mediated by IL-13, you see a marked increase in submucosal inflammatory signal. These pathways then set up a crosstalk amongst the cells to further enhance the inflammatory response. Now notice that with this injury comes a scar manifested by fibrin deposition. And you can see how the type two macrophages in concert with fibrin can start to bulge the submucosa and you can almost get a sense that the polyp is being developed. And indeed, as it develops, the scarring puckers the epithelium, and we start to get the proliferation of a nasal polyp. This is being mediated for the most part by unbridled inflammation. The inflammation laying more matrix and fibrin beneath the lamina reticularis, and that's causing the polyp development. The key histiologic features of nasal polyps, the thickened basement membrane, stromal submucosal edema, and scarring in the magnified call out there, you can see the tremendous amount of inflammatory infiltrates, including the acetophils and plasma cells dispersed throughout the nasal polyp. So what's the takeaway here? ongoing inflammation, as well as some mucosal edema and matrix deposition. These are the key histiologic features of the nasal polyp. Now, considering the pathophysiology and the clinical approach, you have to understand the underlying inflammatory response. And we highlighted that both atopic and non-atopic. That leads to local presentation and symptoms, and understanding the comorbidities associated with the nasal polyps gives us a better understanding of the holistic care that needs to be delivered for the patient. So a case study is really the pulmonologist considerations for the diagnosis. This is very important because the pulmonologists need to be aware that the nasal polyps can compromise the management of other diseases. Now, this case study is a male, age 41, has severe refractory asthma with recurrent oral corticosteroid use. Now, importantly, aspirin sensitivity had caused hives and a recent feeling of nasal congestion without relief from over-the-counter medications leads the patient into a diminished quality of life. The loss of smell and taste further impacts on the functional status. At that point, the pulmonologist really needs to seek the expertise of other specialists. In my own practice, we work closely with ENT or ear, nose, and throat physicians to assess nasal polyps and to make the early diagnosis to affect management. Now, what is the pulmonologist's consideration for the management? Well, confirmation of nasal polyps by a colleague, an ear, nose, and throat or allergist, certainly firms up a diagnosis of comorbidity. Our overall goals will be to relieve symptoms, prevent exacerbations, recognize and manage all the comorbidities, to improve the quality of life, and to diminish oral corticosteroid management. So the overall goals of managing the asthma is in concert with that of the nasal polyps. And integrating care for patients with nasal polyps is demonstrated in this Venn diagram. The patient understands the diagnosis and feels more empowered. This allows for active and shared decision-making Primary care physician understands how the symptoms relate to comorbidities and impact the quality of life. And the specialist is going to focus on understanding how the symptoms and comorbidities are integrated and devise a management approach. It really does require an interdisciplinary shared decision-making model 
to improve the care of patients with nasal polyps. So in summary, what we went through is a shared pathophysiology, the epithelium playing a critical role in the induction of nasal polyps and their association with comorbid conditions, the most commonly shared with airways disease. The connection between the upper and lower respiratory tract may reflect a shared inflammatory mechanism, type 2 inflammation, often associated with nasal polyps. What is the clinical impact? Well, nasal polyps in combination with other airway conditions can add to a patient's symptomatic burden and pose a challenge for disease management. And what is our approach? Our approach must be a multidisciplinary management schema. Optimal patient care requires an integrated approach to recognize potential nasal polyp presentation and facilitate the proper diagnosis and management of the patient in a holistic manner. I want to thank Novartis for sponsoring this exciting program. And I wish you the very best. And thank you for the honor and privilege of presenting today.